So the next talk is from Chris Baker from the Jackson Labs. And um, it will be on genetic control of the epigenetic landscape. Yep. All right. Um, so thanks, everybody, uh, for coming. And I appreciate the organizers to give me this opportunity to tell you a story about my current research. And today I'm going to talk a little bit about how natural genetic variation in, in mouse uh, helps control chromatin states. Okay. There we go. Okay, so there's sort of three main observations that have come out of uh, sort of modern genomics that, I, that have an uh, impact on what I'm going to tell you today. So the first really is that, uh, you know, after genomes were sequenced, it was realized fairly quickly that a much uh, larger fraction of, of human, mouse, and many mammalian genomes are regulatory rather than protein coding, and that makes sense in terms of developmental biology, thinking about how we come from a single cell and to uh, differentiate to, into many different types of cells. Also, uh, most polymorphisms that have been identified sort of in GWAS studies in humans particularly, uh, that influence various physiological traits uh, have been found to be in regulatory elements, and that's sort of a fusion of functional genomics and genetics. And then uh, large pro programs such as ENCODE and Phantom, and as, as well as many other small labs, have shown that regulatory elements can be um, defined by specific epigenetic modifications. In, in case, these cases, I mean post-translational modification of histone tails. So I have sort of a, a cartoon. Let's see how the mouse works. Chicken. Okay. So, so just a cartoon here of a sort of a, a um, you know, a, a transcribed region where we have a couple of functional elements, either a promoter or enhancer as we think of them. And, and so these can be marked by specific epigenetic marks, and these sort of characterize what they are. And for the purposes of the talk today, I'm mostly going to be talking about uh, histone H3 lysine 4 trimethylation. Okay, so in general, we, we sort of think of genetics. We think about a genome, and uh, in natural populations, of course, over time, these can pick up mutations to give us the sort of diversity that we see. Uh, and we think about epigenetics, we think about a single genome, but in this case, it undergoes types of modifications, whether these are the post-translational modifications I talked about on histone tails, variants. We start to appreciate more about how non-coding RNAs or DNA sequence-specific binding factors. Uh, so the, the, the sum total is this can create many different epigenomes and influence development and differentiation, but potentially what we understand a little bit less about uh, that I'm interested in is how the sort of natural genetic variation that we see in population influences this. So as been sort of a theme so far in this talk, we know, we know a lot about this, the factors that can uh, actually deposit these marks, but a little bit less perhaps about the factors that determine where these marks and when these marks get deposited. So I just wanted to ask a basic question, which is what are the regulatory factors that can control the epigenetic landscape? So in order to do this, I was going to take a sort of a <clears throat> genetic approach and measure genome-wide H3K4 trimethylation, particularly in, in male germ cells, and I'll talk about why we use those as a model in a second. And we, we chose to, to start with uh, two different strains of mice, just sort of our, our black six mouse and DBA2J, D2 mice, and we'll do chip seek in germ cells from three replicates. And one of the advantages of of also choosing these strains is that um, they have the same allele of PRDM9, and now I haven't talked much about PRDM9 here, but in previous um, IG, um, yeah, um, Genome Society meetings, I, I've talked about PRDM9, and, and, and really it's uh, highly variable. It's, uh, there's um, a large number of alleles within the mouse strains, and it determines where meiotic recombination occurs, and it's also a methyl transferase. So these two strains of mice happen to have the same allele of PRDM9, so we're going to fix this, this particular epigenetic. Uh, enzyme. The other benefit, of course, is that there's a well-described large collection of recombinant inbred lines between these two uh, strains of mice that we have at the Jackson Laboratory where I work, and uh, so we can collect germ cells from each individual, individual RI line, uh, which is, of course, uh, homozygous at every locus, but a mosaic of the two parents. So first I'll focus just on the parents um, in which we collected germ cells. Oh, and I'll just mention that we also wanted to work in germ cells because it will allow us to differentiate um, the epigenetic control between different enzyme systems, in which case I mean the sort of SET1 and MLL compass um, complexes that, that regulate a lot of the, the H3K4 trimethylation at the sort of promoters and functional elements versus uh, the one that's due to PRDM9 here. <clears throat> which I mentioned is a methyl transferase that makes this H3K4 trimethyl mark 
at particular regions in the genome that will then undergo double strand breaks and, and become uh, uh, meiotic recombination. So we can sort of separate uh, maybe uh, uh, factors that influence this type of epigenetic mark uh, at, at these functional elements versus others. So, okay, so here's an example of the data. Uh, this is uh, just three replicates of the of germ cell uh, chip from germ cells of B and B6 mice. And uh, this is looking at a particular PRDM9 dependent site, and you can see that it's, you know, present in B6 and, and, and absent in D2. Uh, and, but this is just one mark. Of course, when we do this, we measure trimethylation in about 75 to 80,000 places in the genome. And so when we compare them, it looks like this. And uh, basically, uh, what I want to point out is that the, um, <clears throat> this is the, each dot represents uh, the H3K4 trimethylation at a particular peak in the genome. <clears throat> and it's sort of the average of, of, of the parents. And then and on the y-axis is the log two-fold change. So if it's, it's marked in blue here, it's, it's, it's significantly higher in B6. If it's marked in D2, it's higher. Uh, I mean, it's marked in orange, it's higher in D2. And of course, if it's black, there's not much difference in between them. And so this, this arrow here just sort of points the position on this where, where, where we would see this particular peak. So there's a lot of variation in this epigenetic mark between these two fairly closely related uh, uh, mouse, mouse strands. And since we're all geneticists, we want to know what are the loci that control this. So we also continued to do this in <clears throat> the recombinant inbred lines. So here's another particular mark. Uh, it's again, it's high in, B, in B6 and low in D2. And when we start doing chip in individual BXD lines, we see that it's uh, segregating pretty much in a Mendelian fashion where it's, you know, where it's either there or not there. And so at this, I think there's about 40 or 42 BXD lines here. We're up to about 55 now. The rest of the data I'm going to show you is, is actually only on 32 lines. So we can do uh, link, uh, interval mapping to identify w w what the locus controlling this, this phenotype is. And so when we do that, we have this really nice strong log, uh, uh, um, um, QTL uh, on chromosome 13. Uh, and then, of course, the, this particular peak itself is located on chromosome 5. So there's a strong trans effect that's influencing the trimethylation at this locus. This is just an example of one. We've done this for, you know, the 75,000 or so peaks that we measured in the genome. We have a permutation threshold and then a, a, a genome-wide FDR. And when we do that, we get about uh, a little less than 7,000 total QTL that are significant in the genome. And, and people who are used to looking at sort of eQTL studies are, will be familiar with this. Um, where this 45-degree diagonal line, of course, represents all of the sort of local QTL, which are about uh, 5,600. The vast majority of them are um, controlling uh, trimethylation locally. But we do have about 1,200 that are in trans. Uh, and of those about, there's probably what we call sort of five major trans bands, these vertical bars where a single QTL uh, will potentially, uh, a, a locus here, uh, controls the trimethylation throughout the genome. And so these five trans bands uh, uh, account for about 62% of all of the trans QTL that we see. So we can split these into the different classes I mentioned earlier, those that are um, the, the, the H3K4 trimethylation peaks that are dependent on PRDM9, and, the, and then just, you know, all the other. Uh, and, and when we do that, we see that, the, you know, of course, we get both uh, uh, cis and trans effects uh, for the ones that are PRDM9 dependent as well. And if we just focus on the, the cis ones here first, uh, as, as ex, uh, potentially expected, you would, we, on, the, on the left here, we see that there's a, a large increase in variant, just because we have the genomes of these two animals, uh, and, and we've actually done quite a bit of work uh, with PRDM9, both in vivo and in vitro, we know where it can bind in the genome, we know the motif, and so we can and look, and we see that there's a large increase in, in frequency of variants at, this, at, at PRDM9 sites in these, in these uh, cis-acting QTL. However, when we look at either single nucleotide variants or small indels, they only account for about 80 percent of the cis-QTL that we see that are PRDM9 dependent. So there's still a pretty large fraction, about 20 percent, that we don't know, uh, we, don't, we haven't seen variants. And so it suggests that there's something else potentially acting locally at, the, at, at, at these recombination sites that are influencing PRDM9 binding that, that doesn't have anything to do potentially with just PRDM9 itself binding. Okay, so we also are interested, of course, in the trans, uh, trans um, 
uh, loci here. And so uh, <clears throat> there's about 200 or so trans QTL that are influenced PRDM9 sites and about a little over 1,000 uh, of up the other. So it's about a one, uh, for every one of these, about five of these over here. And so when we look at these particular um, <clears throat> trans bands that I talked about, uh, when, when we look at the chromosome four and seven, we see that these are actually uh, enriched for uh, <clears throat> uh, PRDM9 dependent recombination sites, three to four fold where the, the QTL on chromosome 13 is about parity. So it, it seems to be influencing both um, PRDM9 dependent and all the other trimethylation sites equally. So we think chromosome 13 is pretty interesting. It, it, uh, it influences uh, H3K4 trimethylation all over the genome, uh, including on the chromosome itself. You can see there's a vertical band here. Uh, and it's about, in this data set, it was about 450 locations. But as we collect more BXD lines, that, that just is giving us more significant numbers. And so it seems to be a lot. Um, <clears throat> So this is one way to view this, but another way is, of course, these sort of circo plot, cir circus plot, circos plots. Um, <clears throat> and when we started to draw these type of plots, and, and, and this is a, a bit, um, it's hard to see, so we just sort of blow up one chromosome here. We started to see, uh, we started to see what we thought looked like clustering of the, of, the, of the peaks. So these are the positions of the H3K4 trimethyl peaks that respond to the particular QTL on 13. And so we, we thought we, they looked like they were potentially clustering in the genome. And when we do some um, statistics, we see that we actually have, uh, using a, a method called R-scan, which just looks at uh, positions along a line and looks for either dispersion or clustering, we see that there is some significance for uh, evidence for clustering of these. And so this is sort of the, the time where I, I'm going to move from um, showing you data to making things up. And so um, we, you know, I, this is sort of where the project is at the point. Um, you know, one of the nature of BXD lines, of course, is that they, they're, they're, they're quite large um, loci that you are, you know, um, regions of the genome that, that you have to contend with. Um, but when we were thinking about, you know, how you could get certain either clustered regions or even individual peaks that respond to particular, uh, 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 is, is responding to particular QTL, we, we reasoned that there must be something uh, being created at this location that has sequence specificity to provide this. And our best candidate, we thought, would be something like either RNA, of course, or uh, DNA binding proteins. So if we look in this region defined by the Q chromosome 13 QTL, it's still quite large. It's about eight megabases. But something that stuck out to us here is this family uh, cluster of zinc finger proteins, which um, is similar to PRDM9. They, have, they usually have you know, highly sequence-specific DNA binding. And zinc finger proteins are, uh, I think, the largest class of, of protein family in the mouse and human genome, and about half of them, somewhere around 400, contain a crab domain, which is a domain that's known to interact with uh, um, uh, chromatin-modifying enzymes. And so this class here is a, is a crab domain zinc finger gene cluster. When we look back at our map here, both the QTLs of 4, 7, and 13 all contain um, these clusters of crab zinc finger proteins um, as well. So our sort of working hypothesis at this point is that uh, we have no evidence that these are, uh, these are what are influencing this, but we would we'd like, we, you know, it makes a nice story to say that these zinc finger domains giving binding specificity where the crab domain could be a protein recruiting domain, and when it interacts with chromatin, it, it's known to recruit um, both histone deacetylases as well as histone methyltransferases that increase the sort of repressive marks that we think at this locus, um, and then therefore could inhibit um, you know, the sort of active H3K4 trimethylation that we see. And so this gives us some hypothesis to test going forward. So the conclusions are that we, we have been able to identify that we have, uh, uh, we see a transacting system that is controlling sort of epigenetic traits, or at least this particular histone mark. Um, we see five major loci that together control about 60% of all the trans effects in germ cells between B6 and D2. Uh, of course, um, you know, they'd have to be, have variation between B6 and D2 to actually see them, so there may be many more that are under trans control that we can't see in this, this particular cross. And that uh, the peaks that respond to a single QTL, at least on chromosome 13, cluster on chromosomes, suggesting that we, we think there's sort of regional control of chromatin at the, at, that, that's controlling this. So with that, I'd, think to, I'd like to thank people uh, in the Pagan Lab, where I've been doing this work. Um, Katrina Spruce and Dylan has helped me collect a lot of the BXD 
the animals. Of course, Ken has been a fantastic uh, PI. Um, the Carter Lab has really helped you, you're going to hear next, um, helped do a lot of the analysis for the, the QTL mapping as well as the, some interesting work that I haven't been able to tell you by some of the uh, people who work in, there, in his lab. The uh, people in Churchill Lab have developed a lot of the software tools that allow us to compare um, and do this type of work in different mouse strains and of course Jack Services and Funding and Carl Broman who's been advising us on this project. So thanks. Thank you. Are there any questions for this talk? Any mutations in the zinc finger crab proteins that are an individual ones that could actually address this question or? Right, so, 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 so far, um, at least for um, the, the chromosome 13 cluster, we, we actually do not see uh, variants between the, the, do the zinc finger binding domains, between the two strains, okay. yeah. They could be acting redundantly or? Yeah. Yeah, okay. maybe make it a large deletion or something. Um, if there's no further questions, let's move on to the next talk. Thank you very much.